and I'm very excited to be hosting this event along with the uh, Tomcat team, Donica, Brian, and Elizabeth. Uh, the Tackling Global Challenges series uh, is designed to highlight problem areas in energy and sustainability, um, provide some insight into a specific area by engaging outside experts, uh, and we hope stimulate conversations uh, to generate uh, new solutions. This is the first season of the series, uh, and the theme is plastic, energy and sustainability challenges associated with plastic with a particular emphasis on what to do about plastic waste uh, and how do we uh, minimize and hopefully eventually eliminate plastic pollution. Uh, so just to, to very briefly recap, this is episode three. So in, in episode one, we heard from Mike Biddle who gave a, a broad overview of the plastic problem uh, and his perspective as an investor and entrepreneur. In episode two, we heard from uh, two experts from the Department of Energy who uh, gave us uh, their view on the R&D horizon for uh, the prospects for developing some innovative new technologies to address the, the plastic waste problem in particular. Uh, and today in episode three, we're, we're focusing on the question, can plastic waste be turned into useful products uh, on a meaningful scale? Uh, and by meaningful, uh, we mean a scale that ultimately is commensurate with the scale of plastic waste generation, uh, which is upwards of 300 million tons per year. Uh, and today we're uh, extremely fortunate uh, to be joined by two uh, entrepreneurs who have uh, founded companies that are working directly in this space. Uh, and developing technologies to address plastic waste. Um, they have actually very complementary uh, approaches. On the one hand, we're gonna hear uh, from our first speaker about a company developing a way to turn plastic into fuels and feedstock chemicals for the regeneration of plastic. Uh, and on, uh, from our second speaker, we're gonna hear about uh, a company that's developed a technology to turn plastic waste into pavement for roads. Uh, so how this is gonna work is uh, we're gonna hear two presentations. Okay, so we'll hear from both of our speakers back to back, and then we will have a combined Q&A session. Um, you should have received a, a link to Poll Everywhere um, from the, the reminder email. Uh, you are uh, welcome and encouraged to submit questions during the presentations uh, to poll everywhere. You can also vote for other questions, try to bring them to the, to the top of the list. Um, the link to that, if you, if you didn't get it from the email, Donica, just put that in the chat. Um, I will do my best to uh, try to uh, weave in as many of those questions as, as possible in the Q&A. Um, we also uh, want to remind you that th there is a Tomcat LinkedIn networking group, which is a great way to connect to um, other people at this event. Uh, one of our goals is to try to bring together pe uh, people with as diverse interests and skills as possible to uh, help generate creative solutions to these problems. Um, okay, so, so let's get started uh, with our first speaker. I'm really pleased uh, to introduce Bob Powell who is the founder and CEO of Brightmark. Um, Bob has spent the majority of his career working in renewable energy. Um, he was uh, an electrical engineer by training. Uh, he has held various uh, leadership positions in the solar and energy management industry, including um, president of North America for Sun Edison, president and CEO of Solar Power Partners, uh, co-founder of a uh, virtual energy team that's helping uh, commercial and industrial customers make better energy decisions. Uh, and he founded Brightmark in 2015 to uh, reimagine waste. And that's the story we're going to hear today. So Bob, thank you so much for, for joining us. And uh, we're excited to, to hear about Brightmark. 
Thanks. Uh, thanks very much, Matthew. Uh, great to be here. And as I look across the screen, I actually see a few familiar names here. So uh, great to uh, speak to some of you all who are old friends and then hopefully new friends as well. So what I'd like to share with you is about Brightmark and what we're doing with respect to plastics. So I'll start with our mission. And if I may, I would like to walk you through a few slides here. Let me pull that up. Quick sort of just polling to make sure the team here can see my presentation. Matthew, is that? Yeah, uh, yeah, we had it there for a sec. Yeah, let's see. We're going into presentation. Here we go. Great. Yeah. Fantastic. Perfect. Okay. Well, let me get to it because um, you know, we could talk about this topic for a long time. So when Matthew set up, you know, is there hope? around solving this immense plastic uh, problem? I believe so. And, and this team at Brightmark is very mission oriented around solving our, uh, our environmental issues. And my Ford button is not working. Let me try. So uh, Danica, could you uh, possibly do me a favor here? And do you mind pulling up the PowerPoint, please? Yes, one second. Thanks. Sorry, gang. So um, our mission at Brightmark is to create a world without waste. And what we're doing is we're tackling two uh, particular areas. One I won't focus as much on is tackling greenhouse gases, predominantly with renewable natural gas, which we create out of food and animal waste. Negative carbon solutions relative to what happens when food and animal waste uh, uh, turns into greenhouse gases, very powerful environmental solution there. But the focus of this is what are we doing with respect to plastics? So um, if we could in presentation mode, if you're able, Danica, to go to slide three. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna leave it in this view only because I, I think it's easier for us to navigate it between the two of us and just say next as you want me to move forward. Will do. Um, so uh, it's quite likely that most of the uh, folks here realize that we've got a tremendous issue with respect to plastic waste. Uh, there was a study that was done in 2015 that uh, really, I think, um, created a sense of awareness around the magnitude of the problem that we have. And one of the things that came out of that particular study was that if we continue as we're going right now, by 2050, there will be more plastic by weight in the ocean than marine life. It's a stunning statistic. And it's one that as I've become and spent more time uh, in and around the oceans as part of our mission here, I've actually seen live myself. So it's a real threat, but I have hope for where we're headed. Um, so you can see not only uh, is it an environmental issue, it also creates a tremendous cost to the tune of trillions of dollars per year. And it's our belief at Brightmark, we need multiple ways to deal with the problem. Part is waste reduction, but much of the problem should be solved with circular solutions that eliminate the waste and then reuse the resources. So our goal in eliminating waste is to be fully circular. We're not fully there yet, and I'll talk a little bit about that journey in a second. But one of the fundamental questions uh, I always think about is, should we be using plastics or not? So Danica, if you could go to the next slide. Um, you know, listen, in the COVID year, I think a lot of us uh, probably realize that there are a lot of life-saving properties associated uh, with plastics. There are a lot of other uses, and I, I think we oftentimes may not know how important plastics are uh, from a safety perspective and a fuel efficiency perspective. So as you can see, there's a lot of fuel and combustibles that are saved by having plastics in, in cars. In fact, as you can see, uh, per car net environmental savings of about $162 relative to other uses. About 50% of the volume of what is contained in cars is plastics, safer, and as I said, more fuel efficient. Another tremendous use for plastics is packaging, which reduces food waste in particular pretty dramatically. And you can see the impacts when, uh, when you think about something that many of us, uh, to the extent we're meat eaters, um, are familiar with. Plastics 
reduce waste and reduce greenhouse gases as a very profound benefit on a per ton basis with respect to things like sirloin steaks, anything that can uh, decay like food waste is benefited by plastic packaging. So let's next slide. So one of the, what, so as a mission oriented company at Brightmark, we're always looking for the best solution. And one of the things that we spend a lot of time thinking about is what are the alternatives and the impacts of alternatives? Um, today's solutions can become tomorrow's environmental problems. And so in our mind's eye, we're always trying to be focused in on, hey, if we can get away with plastic, like for example, plastic straws, I think that's probably a really good thing to consider. Some other alternatives to plastics uh, have more environmental impact and more cost impacts as well. Uh, we have the sites on the studies here if anybody's interested in the future in getting that. So these are not simple ban the plastics types of solutions that we can offer people. So we think with the power of plastics, one really good way of dealing with it is what can we do post use with plastics? And that's where part of our solution comes in. Next, next slide. So, but why do we throw away plastics? We throw away plastics that we use because fundamentally right now there's no value associated with them. And so it, what, one of the, the things that I talk with people about often is if, you know, for example, I live uh, here in the city in San Francisco, if a plastic bottle is on the street there, um, probably somebody is going to pick it up eventually. Um, that being said, if there was a $20 bill uh, take to that water bottle, what would happen to it? It's quite likely somebody would see the $20 bill, pick it up, hopefully do something with the plastic bottle, but certainly they would take the $20 bill because there is value there. What I will tell you is there is value in plastics that we are not unlocking. And that's why right now, only 9% of the world's plastics that we use and then discard are being recycled. Next slide, please. But the fundamental value of plastics is that they are basically a series of hydrocarbon molecules attached to each other. Um, those atoms have incredible use. While it is not our preference, certainly hydrocarbon atoms in the form of diesel and gasoline are valuable products. Lubricants, motor oils are just a series of hydrocarbon atoms as well. Um, and then Finally, plastics themselves and the great uses of plastics are valuable. So how do we deal with something that has inherent value that has been used and we unlock the value? That's where our technology comes in. So if we could go to the next slide. The, uh, the untapped value is pretty immense here. Um, certainly if plastics that we use here in the States were all converted to fuels, you could fuel 9 million uh, cars a year on them. So again, unlock value there. Next slide. So as I said, when I gave you the example of the $20 bill in the plastic bottle, what we think is necessary in order to solve the problem is to create an ecosystem where the value is unlocked in plastics so that the right level of incentives are made so that people will collect plastics, bring them to parties like Brightmark, uh, who have solutions to, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> to then create useful products out of the plastics after we use them. There need to be the right level of incentives. And how that happens is by us creating products that people are willing to um, provide an economic benefit associated with those products so that we can also help those economically that bring what is now a waste product to us, create an ecosystem of value there. Next slide, please. So let me talk about our technology. Our technology is a form of technology known as pyrolysis. <coughs> Excuse me. Our technology, um, the specific application of it was invented over 15 years ago, is patented in most countries in the world and has the ability to process at scale post-use plastics. Let me talk process 
and then I'll talk about some of the uh, inherent advantages of our specific application. So what we do is we take waste that's collected um, either in bales of plastic waste, which are typically, if you know the numbering system, one through seven, most typically three through seven bales, um, and then other forms of specialty uh, streams, like we get uh, baby car seats in our facility in Ashley, Indiana as well. And what we do is we shred, dry, and pelletize the plastics. And then in the next step, we take the plastics and we heat them in an oxygen-starved environment, no combustion there associated with the conversion of plastics. And in stainless steel vessels, we heat and create a vapor. And uh, as we feed in the front end of the vessel, the vapors come out of the back end. We cool the vapors and we create a liquid stream. And uh, there is a gas stream as well. This is actually used to uh, create the energy that's necessary to heat our stainless steel vessels. The liquid stream is then uh, captured and cooled into, it's a hydrocarbon liquid, which we currently in our first facility, which I'll talk about in just a second here, um, then converts into ultra low sulfur diesel, naphtha, which uh, has two primary purposes. One is a gasoline um, uh, feed in um, blending. And then the other is uh, as potentially an input feedstock in order to remake plastics and then wax, which can be paraffin or food grade waxes as well. It's a simple process and concept, a bit more complicated. I'm not a chemical engineer, but we've got a lot of really smart chemical engineers that uh, both invented and commercially applied our technology. So next slide, what plastics do we take? We can take, Danica, if you could go to the next slide. Thank you. We can actually take, all plastics one through seven. Most typically we do not receive in great volumes one through seven as PET number one and HDPE number two, some force as well, LDPEs, are actually mechanically recycled. That's, that's that 9% number I told you about. But we can take every last bit of the plastics. One of the, so it's not a single stream solution here. Um, and so, we have the ability on that 91% of plastics that are not recycled and reused to take them into our process. So it's commingled and we run at a continuous rate, which helps make the process viable economically, in addition to operate at a scale where we can tackle this globally. Uh, we're 93% efficient in our process. And the 7% that is an inefficiency is an inert, uh, non-toxic, landfillable residue. And uh, actually, the advantage um, with respect to greenhouse gases for getting the great benefit of plastics is greater than 14%. We did our own uh, life cycle analysis, which has now been completed. And when you compare our process to extract, extracting the feedstocks, crude oil and natural gas from the ground, and then converting them into plastics and then landfilling them after they're used, we actually provide a 24% greenhouse gas uh, benefit relative to the traditional process that I just described. So it's very powerful, not just from pulling uh, plastics out of the environment, but definitely also from a greenhouse gas perspective. So if you could go to the next slide. All right. I told you our first facility is uh, located in Indiana. It's located in Northeast Indiana, and we are almost complete with the plant. Uh, we started construction two years ago in April 2019, invested a total of $265 million, including green bonds that we used to help finance the facility. And uh, as I said, we'll be online. And our annual rate of that first phase in Ashley, Indiana, it's 100,000 uh, 100, tons of plastics a year that we then convert into diesel and then the naphtha, which I described, as well as the wax that I described as well. 18 million is the first uh, gallons, the first two, six of the wax as well. And you can see the metric ton offset of the greenhouse gas emissions that we have each year from that specific facility. So what I told you is diesel and naphtha, 
particularly as they're combustible, is not really something that I'm uh, happy with from a long-term perspective. But we're on a journey towards circularity. And what I will tell you is when we were commercializing our technology and uh, seeking to finance and invest that significant amount of capital in that facility in Indiana, uh, four or five years ago, we couldn't find customers to take the liquids and turn them back into plastic. So we had to very pragmatically uh, produce products that were commodities that are combustibles. The world has changed. So if we could go to the next slide. The world has changed. And I will tell you now, unlike four and five years ago, when we were designing Ashley, there are uh, producers of plastics, your consumer brands, who are now knocking down our door because I think the world has finally realized that what we need to do for any form of waste, including plastics, is to close the loop. So all of our future facilities will be circular, totally geared towards circularity, where what we do is we take plastics, convert them with the efficiency that I told you, and then provide the feedstocks in order to remake plastics because we think a world without combustibility, which is another form of waste that does create greenhouse gases, is not the ultimate goal and where we shouldn't be. So uh, our long term is around circularity and closing the loop. Let's go to the next slide. So to answer your question, Matthew, in terms of can this be done globally? Absolutely can. Um, our technology is scalable, economic, and generally at four to eight times the size of the facility there, uh, the first phase in Ashley, Indiana, and at a lower cost per ton produced. Uh, and we're currently developing facilities, more facilities in North America. Uh, we actually, a year and a half ago, uh, publicly announced that we were starting an RP process for our new sites in North America. We have projects under development in Europe and in Asia Pacific as well. And a couple of months ago, we actually announced a relationship with a large Korean concern that is helping us uh, it, with at least one location in Asia Pacific. So we can do it at scale. We can take all of the plastics, create fully circular solutions. And so we believe that the answer is yes. And we're super optimistic about the future. So let's go to the next slide. So we've made commitments and within the next five years, what we intend to do is divert uh, over 8 million metric tons of plastic from landfills in the natural environment. And that, as I said, we now move to a fully circular model and both with our renewable natural gas projects and our plastic projects offset significant CO2 emissions. So happy to answer questions as we get into it uh, later. Um, a very quick overview around the process, plastics and their uses, and then ultimately the fully circular nature, which is where uh, we ultimately want all of us to be. So with that, I'll pause and look forward to the questions in a few. Thanks. Thank you, Bob. That was, uh, that was terrific. So uh, we're gonna go right to our next speaker. Um, and so, so hold your questions for, uh, for Bob, please put them in the poll everywhere. Uh, and then uh, after our next speaker, we will uh, have a chance to, to talk to both of them. So I am uh, very pleased to introduce uh, Sean Weaver. He is the president of NEO. Um, Sean has been working since uh, 2006 to uh, disrupt and transform the uh, pavement industry. So in 2006, he uh, founded uh, Technosoil Global and Technosoil Industrial. Um, these were uh, originally working on developing uh, new pavements for sidewalks and pathways at, at campuses. Um, and then based on that success, uh, they set their sights on a uh, higher volume product uh, and developed a recycled uh, road system that combines recycled asphalt uh, with a, a binder that's generated from chemically recycled plastic. Uh, so Sean is gonna uh, tell us about his technology, tell us about the story of, of NEO and uh, thank you so much for, for being here today. Yeah, thank you, Matthew, for having me today. I uh, really appreciate it. 
So I'm the CEO and founder of uh, Tech and Soil Industrial, which is the creator of the Neo technology. Um, and so that's me. So today we're going to talk about the technology, the history and evolution, the material and process, performance and sustainability, the recycling process, and then the power of scale. So when we created NEO, we weren't trying to solve the plastic waste problem. We were trying to solve a road rehabilitation problem, led up, which led us to the plastic waste problem. So it was kind of uh, a lot of times material science students will you know, try to develop a, a compound and then try to find a product for it. We found the, uh, the product and then tried to work backwards. So NEO began as a journey to build a better road. And so back in 2012, I started looking at different adhesive systems that would just bond aggregate together. And what I was trying to do was trying to build a golf cart path, um, just kind of open up a new market for like a natural paving material that looked natural. And uh, so without any, um, uh, without any restraints, I looked at every compound, every type of adhesive that I could get my hands on. So epoxy, urethane, acrylic, polyethylene, I mean, just basically everything I could find to glue pebbles together or rocks together. And so it kind of begs the question, you know, roads are built out of tar. And what we ended up coming up with was, you know, more like super glue. And so, you know, would you rather build a road out of tar or super glue? So when we started, uh, we developed this natural paving product and we became pretty successful at uh, corporate campuses. Uh, it's used at the Apple, Google, Facebook, Amazon campuses. Uh, they use it almost exclusively. In uh, 2015, we started uh, a program where we looked at the, the binder technology used with 100% recycled asphalt. And uh, in 2015, we built our first uh, road in St. George, Utah, and it's on the right-hand side of the screen. And you can see on the left-hand side of the screen is traditional asphalt with the thermal cracking in it. So this road here is about uh, six years old. So in 2000, uh, so we built the first road in 2015, and then we had to solve just a whole slew of technical problems. How do you pump super glue? You know, like how can you pump super glue reliably? And uh, you know, it typically clogs up the pumps, and then we have to dust the five thousand dollar pump. And so we we worked through all these technical problems over the next four years. And uh, in two thousand nineteen, the uh, Department of Energy reached out to me, and they said, "Hey, we understand you have a road recycling technology that that could use a lot of plastic waste." And we said, "Yeah." Um, and they asked us, hey, what can we do to kind of further your, uh, your mission? And, uh, you know, first I asked them for money and they said no. <laughs> and then the second I asked them to introduce me to uh, a city uh, such as Los Angeles. So they, uh, we met in Los Angeles. Um, Los Angeles agreed to uh, look at my program and they ran uh, 1,400 lab tests the first two, two months. And uh, the result of the lab test basically said uh, we were 10 times the performance of normal asphalt with six times less energy to produce it. At the same time, we recycle 100% of the road. So in 2020, we commenced with some in-ground trials. And in uh, December 2020, uh, we did a high profile street in front of the Disney concert hall uh, with the mayor. So this is, uh, they took, they basically gave us the worst road uh, in Los Angeles. And this road you see on the right here has the highest bus loading out of any road in the city. And it happens to be on a slight upgrade and it's a left-hand turn. So if you add all those things together, it's the most, that road section receives the highest distress levels. Uh, basically a, a city bus in Los Angeles is equal to nine e -cells. 
and each uh, ESAL is, is equal to like a semi truck, and every semi truck is equal to 5,600 passenger cars. So, just in the last four to five months that our road piece has been down, it's gotten the equivalent of like 35 or 40 million cars over it. Uh, they would have expected that road to rot at least one inch by now, and it has not. So you can see the road piece here. So with this technology from, uh, from NEO, we can move closer to our most ambitious climate goals, improve the way we deliver high quality city services and pave the path to a greener future. That was a very nice uh, a quote we got from the mayor after the event. So we started really thinking about uh, plastic waste and could we incorporate large amounts into our system? And so it kind of started a kind of a thought process where, you know, plastic waste is a problem, failing roads is obviously a problem. Uh, maybe we can provide a solution for both. So it's all about the binder. Uh, Neo, we arrived at a urethane-based binder. Um, urethanes are kind of interesting in that you can bring in many input streams of different grades of plastic into it. Um, obviously, PET is easy to put into it, but we can also bring in HDPE as a you know a different uh, mechanism into into the binder. As well as we can, um, we're working on carbon capture liquefying uh, CO, sucking CO2 out, liquefying it, and we can make a useful molecule uh, with that as well for it. So what we feel the pavement that we've created, you know, we're using 100% of the existing road. Um, it's not asphalt, it's not concrete, it's a new category of pavement. We call it composite pavement or plastic pavement. And it has some unique uh, properties that uh, asphalt does not have. So here's a picture of the road recycling processing trailer. So we use, a, a, we modified existing equipment that was available to the market now. So hold in place recycling existed, but it could only build a road that was a percentage as strong as a HMA road. And uh, right now we're putting the equivalent loading of about 150,000 plastic bottles uh, per lane mile. We know we can double, triple, quadruple this, this loading. Uh, but we're going to do it uh, at a scale uh, approach. And uh, because the road lasts, you know, in the lab, we're getting, you know, many times greater than two to three times, but uh, we're being very conservative with a two to three times longer life cycle to HMA, uh, which ultimately delivers 50% uh, life cycle savings to the taxpayers. That's good. Oh, there we go. So here's the process. Um, so we have the, uh, the binder in the first uh, vehicle, the orange tanks there, and then we have a milling machine and then the processing unit in back of it. Um, so we do it all in one step. Uh, we mill the road, crush the material, uh, combine it with the binder. Uh, the finished uh, mixed material comes out the back of the machine and the paver picks it up. So it's all done in one continuous process. So with our technology performance as a driver, we are trying to build the, the most high performing road pavement we could. Um, and what we ended up getting out of the labs what, was that roads fail for a number of reasons. Um, sometimes they rut, sometimes it's thermal cracking. Uh, there's a whole host of, uh, of failure modes for roads. And what we found was uh, with our binder with 100% recycled uh, material, 
we can create a material that is highly uh, resistant to reflective cracking, meaning if there's uh, defects in the lower layers, if we recycle the top layer, they won't reflect into the upper layer. And that's extremely unique. Uh, So typically with uh, normal pavement, strength and fle flexibility is a trade-off. If you get, uh, if you make something stiffer, you know, it has more, it's more apt to crack. And if you make something more flexible, it's more apt to rut. So tip with typical pavements, it's always been a trade-off. Um, with, with our system, uh, we, you kind of get the, be the best of both worlds. We, we have increased uh, strength and increased uh, ductility. It's kind of like an aircraft wing. I kind of use that as an analogy. An aircraft wing flexes, but it always snaps back to its original position. Um, with an asphalt road, it flexes under the load of, say, a bus, but it only snaps back 99.9%. And so, you know, after, you know, a million cycles of buses going over it, you know, now it's only snapped back 95%. And so that's kind of a lot of the reason why uh, roads fail to begin with. So in the lab, um, we have a uh, fatigue life ratio of 6.6 .6 to 13.1 times longer lasting than HMA. Uh, and you can see uh, this is a rutting test. Uh, we got zero rut after 20,000 cycles. So here's some lab results from Los Angeles. You know, if you look at uh, the Marshall stability of uh, Traditional bituminous material, it's 2,500 pounds, we're 26,000 pounds. And so you can see it's quite a, quite a difference. So uh, with our system, because we use no heat, uh, we get a 94% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions uh, versus uh, the traditional HMA mill and fill for a road rehabilitation. So there's 42 billion tons of asphalt in the world's roads um, there's a lot of carbon associated with that material, you know, to get that material, mine that material, process that material and transport that material. If we can reuse all of that material, obviously that reduces uh, a lot of tr uh, trucking and uh, fuel consumption and, uh, you know, traditional road fact, there's 84 trucks needed per lane mile to haul in, haul out the waste material and haul in new material. And so just that process alone destroys the surrounding roads. So how do you get plastic into roads? So there's two methods that are being uh, taken on right now. Um, one, uh, there's a company out of Europe that uh, is melting plastic and hot mix. Um, and uh, we wish them luck, but uh, we've taken a, a different approach to it. We chemically recycle the plastic uh, using a glycolysis process uh, and we extract 100% of the monomers. And so, uh, <clears throat> So you can kind of see the, uh, the process here. So it can accommodate a broad range of input grades of various plastic streams. And so we can take distressed plastic, you know, the, the people that remelt bottles into bottles, well, they can only do that a certain amount of times. And then the plastic becomes distressed and they, it goes to a landfill. We can actually take that distressed material and capture hundred percent of the monomers out of it. So it's, uh, so, you know, even uh, fiber feedstocks that some of, a lot of that material is not recycled now. So we think this uh, depolymerization uh, plus end of uh, life use uh, kind of equals, you know, we're sequestering the plastic in the roads. And uh, at the uh, end of the road's life in 40 to 50 years, we can just use the same process and recycle that road again. So what's the feasibility of scale? So it needs to check all the boxes. Technically viable, commercially viable, and scalable. So I began to evaluate the feasibility of recycling plastic at scale and who the stakeholders would be, um, who I would uh, reach out to and see if I could get interest. And I kind of found at the end of the day it was large scale energy companies with terminals positioned globally, uh, the world's leading by two men suppliers that have existing distribution networks, large scale chemical producers to make our other components and then 
governments and municipalities to participate in the plastic collection. And then we can set up the, uh, the recycling plants at the, at the terminals. So after speaking with these groups, you know, I thought, you know, the plastic waste problem will start to be solved when a technology becomes the catalyst to monetize it at scale, much like Bob said earlier. If we can create a high value uh, material out of it, um, then I think the private industry will get involved. And with ours, you know, we can make a compound for 25 cents that's worth $1.25 uh, per pound. So the value for stakeholders, uh, countries get better roads, which leads to boosted GDP. Manufacturers secure a new market with low cost feedstocks. The road industry produces longer lasting roads and reduced carbon emissions by 94%. Citizens get safer roads with substantially less potholes. And you really won't see construction zones uh, with our process because they'll deploy the trains 10 o'clock at night, they'll finish at four in the morning, they'll reopen the road that next morning. So imagine not sitting in a construction zone anymore. And then obviously the rate of pollution slow, slowing on the planet would be a goal for all. So what's next for NEO? So we're, we're gonna accelerate the merging of lab and field results. So we get this you know, incredible life cycle extension in the lab of six to 13 times. Right now with our machines, we're getting two to three, but we're gonna optimize our equipment lines to achieve the optimum outputs and then we can get closer to the lab results. Um, we're gonna refine the formulation to incorporate additional plastic types. Um, that will come as we uh, start uh, getting revenue and then uh, engage with partners and governments to support global implement implementation. So we feel it's, uh, you know, you get, it's a win-win. You get durability and sustainability. So that concludes my piece here. Thank you, Sean. Terrific. Uh, so yeah, I wanna remind everyone, you can, you can still submit questions uh, through poll everywhere. Uh, we're gonna move to the Q&A session now. Um, I'm gonna try to balance it uh, between questions uh, for Bob and for, for Sean. Obviously they have two uh, very different technologies, very different uh, businesses. Um, but, uh, you know, both of you have presented uh, basically a, a vision for how, how this could scale to, uh, you know, re really enormous uh, volumes. I guess I want to start at, at a high level and maybe I'll start, Bob, with you. What do you see as the biggest challenge for getting to scale? So you're about to bring your, your first plant uh, online this year. You talked about activity uh, really across the globe. What, what is the biggest challenge that, that you see in taking this from 100,000 tons a year to, to megaton to, to multi-megaton? Yeah, I, I think it is the ability to, to deploy and build our projects so that we're making a difference as soon as possible. And when you talk about investments of, in, and as I said in my presentation, roughly four to eight times the size uh, will be each one of our new projects there. You're talking about 500 million to a billion dollars worth of capital. And while the team has a lot of experience in project finance and energy infrastructure uh, throughout the globe, there's a lot of capital. Um, and then forget the capital part of it, the construction turning on. So there's a lot of bandwidth necessary in order to do that. And when I see a clock like the 2050 clock and then what many of us believe is a climate crisis as well, um, it is how do we get, to, how can we do this and do it with credibility, like have people who can construct, et cetera, quick enough so that we can make a difference here. I think that's the biggest, uh, biggest issue we have now since our technology is at a point where like we know it works, we just need to build it as soon as possible. Great, thank you. So, uh, and yeah, I'm gonna, um, we're gonna dive a little bit deeper into questions around the technology in, in just a minute. But uh, Sean, I wanna give you a chance to tell us for Neo, what, what is the biggest challenge for 
scaling. So at, the, at this point, it's finding the right uh, partners. And um, for us, we've been lucky enough that they found us. And so we're already having those discussions um, with companies that have global terminals that want to that have the want uh, to uh, uh, incorporate our technology into the road networks. They've had the discussions with the governments. And so I think that uh, over the six, next six months, it's just negotiating those commercial contracts and, and, and start moving. Uh, we'll pick a territory and, and we'll, we'll start. We're going to start North America, but we're going to pick another territory as well. So, yeah, it, it seems like actually for both of you that there are a lot of stakeholders involved in, in this process of, of scaling and, and, and rolling this out. Is that, is that a significant obstacle, basically communicating with you know, everybody in your supply chain? Bob, for you, I, I, I guess uh, there's a question around who, who is off taking your liquids and, uh, and products, particularly as you start to go to plastic monomers. Do you have to then figure out how you co-locate with those with those customers, um, Sean? You you mentioned, of course, getting municipalities uh, behind you as well as the other um, other stakeholders involved in urethane production. Um, how do you how do you manage that, um, and how do you how do you so, see that going so forward? I, I've been with the, um, my manufacturer since two thousand and thirteen. Uh, we spent uh, the last eight years together discussing how we would roll and scale this up from, from their end, and, and we got that covered. I just was missing the piece of, uh, you know, we need this large energy company with, with terminals uh, globally to buy into it. And to be quite frank, it was non-existent. I, didn't, I couldn't find any of these guys for the last, you know, seven years. And uh, just recently, uh, they, came, they came to me. This just, I, they started and started getting some press and then they started exploring, you know, my technology and they said, Hey, you know, they put me through the paces and, uh, and then they said, Hey, let's, let's, let's move forward at a, on a phased approach. So it's really it's sort of the, the plastic angle you think that caught their attention? It, it, for sure. You know, I was always pushing these, this high performance road and, and I think it's that technology stands on its own. But when I started, promoting that we could put recycled plastic in it, that changed everything. Uh, Los Angeles wants to be the first city to take their plastic waste stream, sort it, you know, they have new technology with optical sorters now, and actually give us a, a facility, some land down there to build a facility, convert the material there, and put it right back into the roads. So they want to kind of lead the uh, world in that. Yeah, and Bob, I, I, for you, I, I guess I'm most curious about, you know, particularly in, in Asia, uh, or, or in Africa, um, is it a challenge to get all of the sort of relevant stakeholders on the same page with respect to setting up, first of all, you know, a huge plant that, that you would want to construct, but also integrating it with the appropriate infrastructure to, to really um, pull this off? Yeah, it's a, it's a pretty profound uh, issue um, in some countries. You know, when we think of Asia, there's a lot of different countries. And so South Korea looks very different than maybe India um, and Vietnam, Burma. But in general, I think for a large part of Asia and Africa, as you mentioned as well, um, yeah, it's more complex. Well, why is that? Because in many places, the waste management infrastructure is not as robust. There are communities uh, that are called uh, pickers in some countries, whatever you know the equivalent translation is. We have people, it's much more of a manual process. It can be done, it just takes longer on the supply side with waste management in some countries. Um, I think that selling the product, depending upon what market you're in, can be a little bit more challenging as well. Um, it may be that the highest use of your product in one location is different than it would be in a Europe or the States. So for example, we're not a huge fan of combustibles. That being said, in some markets, that may be the most viable way to go. We want to avoid that, but there's, so there's some very pragmatic differences. 
and for us to take an approach that the states, the Europe, more developed industrialized uh, countries works in different countries is not uh, not really what our experience has been. So when you see us announce projects in the future, I think what you're going to find, unfortunately, is there's work going on in less developed countries, but the first projects you're going to see from us are where they're more robust waste management infrastructure, as well as a little bit more of robust economy on the offtake side, um, you know, the feedstocks necessary, the monomers, et cetera. Um, so yeah, it creates more issues. And, you know, so we have decisions to make. Do we, because we can't develop 100 projects at once, at once across the globe. So do we go with more developed and create a critical mass while we put on the back burner some other locations that simply will take longer? Yeah, it's part of what we're, we think through uh, as we think strategically how to solve the equation here. And, and diving into the, the processes uh, a, a little bit deeper, and I, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll start with, um, with Brightmark's process first. Um, so you, you mentioned that these, these facilities, are, they're designed to run 24-7. Um, the first question is sort of around the, the feedstock, the sourcing there. So, so it seems like you will inevitably have a heterogeneous feedstock. Um, is is the really the the key to your technology the fact that it can operate despite the fact that your your feedstock coming in is not consistent? Is is that part of what what sort of differentiates you from other pyrolysis um, technologies? And then I, I guess a rela somewhat related question is, you know, how do you manage? Um, harmful, um, you know, possible harmful emissions, um, especially for something like uh, PVC um, that, you know, generating chlorinated uh, emissions. Yeah, um, and so back to the last one again, we don't combust inside our reactor vessels. So it helps eliminate emissions from that perspective, but, um, and then I'll go back to your original question in a, in a side or the first question. Um, with chlorides, Pragmatically, we can take up to what eight nine percent of chlorides in our process. I will tell you. Uh, so, Sean, uh, down in LA, they use optical sorters. We use optical sorters as well. We actually have a couple of videos on our website where I, I and other people are tossing them in. We we oftentimes will pull out uh, some of the PVC. Um, I think PVC is one of the most problematic issues we have in the plastic area that I see because of the chlorides. Um, again, we can take them, but it really creates uh, havoc uh, downstream in our process. Um, the catalysts that we have are used at a much higher rate. So we try to sort out those, but we can, again, we can take them all. Um, and we don't have environmental issues associated with what we take on mass. Our process actually looks better, works better when we have a lot of different types of uh, of plastics, uh, a greater array, uh, if you will, almost a broader distribution curve in terms of the types of plastics that are coming in. It works really well from a cracking perspective. Some paralysis technologies sort of utilize it similarly. More that are maybe more familiar to some, particularly in the States, will take single streams like a polystyrene. Um, so what we were seeking when we decided to, to actually uh, by the technology was something that had the greatest application. And that's why I think it's very powerful to be able to take all the one through seven plastics in our process. It, was that helpful? Yeah, yeah, that's helpful. And and you integrate, so basically you do the fuel refining yourself. I mean, you, you're the, the output from this Ashley facility will be fuel grade diesel or, or, is, or is it a you know liquid product that's going to uh, another party that's gonna refine it further? Yeah, so in Ashley on the first phase, we're actually, and it really has to go pragmatically to the market I talked about before when we were designing a project four to five years ago. Um, the only market we had, people would not buy our product to, to throw into crackers to remake plastics. So we designed it with um, a fuel upgrade system. So we have a hydro treater on the uh, on site as well, a steam methane reformer for some of the more uh, technically oriented people here on the call. The call and uh, distillation column. So we produce the three primary products directly on site. The ultra low sulfur diesel is actually on spec. 
and British Petroleum is it's public is our customer. When they pull up the trucks there, they will uh, they will load off the uh, ULSD as they call it the acronym, and then put it right into their tanks. And then on the naphtha side, when we process it, um, initially it will be going into, as we understand it, likely the gasoline blending tanks. Fortunately. Uh, together with our partner, we're looking for fully circular solutions there. So yeah, we uh, we have the fuel upgrade system um, on site. In the future, that may not be the case. So as the market from selling our product has changed, there are co-location location opportunities that we have where that liquid stream, we, uh, we may hydro treat it a little bit to pull out some of the elements of it there, but we may take that whole stream post hydro treating and feed it into co-located plants or plants where you might um, you know, deliver that, that liquid product so they can then be upgraded at someone else's facilities. Okay, thank you. And, and Sean, you mentioned a period of, uh, you, you know, a lot of troubleshooting in terms of getting the, the, the binder properties right for the, the pavement. Can, can you give us a little bit more insight into sort of what the problems were that you ran into and what you, what you had to solve there? Yeah, so, uh, uh, you know, when you, urethanes react with moisture, right? So inherently there's moisture in the pavement, there's moisture in the air. So we had to slow down the reaction. And then at the same time for performance properties, we had to really balance the tensile and elongation properties to get a very, you know, middle of the road where we, you know, duct, ductility, you know, we had sufficient ductility. At the same time, we had sufficient uh, tensile strength for taking heavy loads. Um, and so it really wasn't actually that difficult, but, um, you know, for a company that didn't have a lot of budget, <laughs> you know, it was a lot of trial and error. Um, um, and, and how much of that is done in the lab versus sort of in these field experiments? I mean, we, we try to get it, you know, get to a, a, a sample we're happy with in the lab and then we'll take it out into the field. Okay. So every time we get a variable, you know, we refine it in the lab, take it to the field. And, and the, um, you, you showed that video, it gets about three vehicles in a row that you start with the tanks or the binder. Yep. Then, if I understand it right, that the next vehicle crushes up the existing surface. It, uh, right? it, it mills the uh, the existing road like uh, between one and four inches deep. Okay. It takes that that milling and it sends it up into the second uh, or the third uh, uh, vehicle, which is the processing trailer. Um, okay. So that has a series of screen decks. It it sizes, it takes the oversize and sends it to a crusher, and then it recombines with the fine material in a pug mill. And then we uh, meter the uh, binder into the pug mill. It makes a hom homogeneous mix and then drops onto the ground in a windrow. And then uh, a paving machine uh, picks up that windrow and paves it. So and all these vehicles were available. You could, you could sort of repurpose existing uh, vehicles or did, or did yeah, you? Yeah, so there's the whole it? recycling process with bituminous products already existed. Okay, so you're just, oh, you're just we, swapping we, out the binder then. Basically. We did, but we had to change out the pumping system. We had to, we refined, you know, the, the crusher and the, the screen decks and, and a few other things to, we're, we're looking for a different gradation than the bituminous guys were. Okay. So getting that gradation, um, yeah. Okay. Was the challenge. And, and so, so this thing is, a, it's a single pass, basically repavement. Yep. You mentioned it could be done overnight. I mean, how fast does that? Does we can that make uh, like between two point five and maybe four miles per shift, eight hour shift, depending wow. on how fast we're running. And so, um, you know, a lot of cities are looking for quick in and out solutions. You know, if you go to like Manila, Philippines, um, they have bumper to bumper traffic twenty four hours a day. So shutting down large, large swaths of road. Is really not an option for them and so you know this could be a potential solution in that we can simply cold recycle that lane between the hours of 10 p.m and 3 a.m or 4 a.m minimize you know traffic flows the least amount reopen that that piece and um you know it becomes a, a good solution for a lot of these cities um but one of the one of the uh, great value propositions we have is for you know, if you take a road in a developing country, a lot of these roads only last one year, you know, as opposed to roads in the US or Germany or Japan. 
that last you know 12 to 20 years with a few maintenance uh, courses done to it. But our system doesn't care if it has a, a low quality aggregate road or a high quality road. You get the same end product because the binder is stronger than the aggregate itself. So we can take a, a road that needs to be rebuilt you know, every year in India and we can turn that into a 40 year road like without this massive infrastructure that the you know, asphalt industry needs to bring there to, to bring up the standards of the roads. We can simply just bring our machines in, our binder, and, and recycle those roads in place. Um, I, I want to ask a, a little bit about the, uh, a little bit more about the inputs uh, and uh, sort of energy balance around, around both of your processes. So, so Baba, I'll start with you. Um, you gave the number, for, I guess going for fuel, it's a 14% reduction. Um, is that because primarily because of the energy intensity of the pyrolysis itself, that you, you have to burn a considerable amount of, of natural gas, I would presume, in, in order to, to do the pyrolysis steps? Is that, is that really the main sort of energy input and, uh, uh, I guess, carbon footprint of your process? That's number one. And then number two, are, are there prospects for turning that over to a renewable energy input? I mean, there's, there's a lot of recent work on trying to, to basically electrify high temperature process heat and industry. Have you looked into any of that? Um, yes, on the last one, and I'll describe that more in a second. Um, there are actually two primary components that are the emitting parts of what we, uh, what we both the process and what we produce. Uh, you nailed it on the first one, which is we use uh, gas, whether it be the non-condensable gas that comes out of our system, uh, or uh, if we have to supplant it with natural gas as well. So that's one. The other is our products that we produce. Um, you know, as you saw, the 18 million gallons a year at the first phase are um, predominantly combustible products. So those are the two factors. Um, associated with that. What are we offsetting? We're offsetting the tremendous amount of methane gas that is used with the extraction of either crude oil or methane out of the ground to produce the virgin plastics. That also includes the, um, the methane emissions at the sort of the wellhead. And then you've got carbon emissions associated with transportation down and ultimately down to the cracking facilities and that sort of that life cycle production of virgin plastics from fossil fuels extracted out of the ground. So we offset that. Um, and when used for fully circular products, uh, as we now have the ability to do with the market changing, that number is much more profound from a greenhouse gas offset because that second largest component turning into transportation fuels will be gone. Um, and as we are actually producing circular products, we will update our life cycle analysis that we completed to make sure that it includes that as well. So the combustion part of our reactor vessels, um, absolutely um, utilizing um, a, a electric energy as the way to heat the vessels is on our target list. In fact, you know, as you said, my prior prior life here, I spent a lot of time with renewables. And what I would love would be for us to actually have solar on top of our facilities with electric, you know, if you will, like heating elements, fairly sophisticated, uh, that are the energy source for our reactor vessels. So what, you know, one thought here is what you can see is, and I've even said this in some of the things I've written about, uh, when you start a journey, it's difficult when you're trying to create economically sustainable solutions to start with perfect. So our journey is one of a good getting to a grade and hopefully closer perfection. Because um, if we were forced four to five years ago into a situation where we could only deliver circular products, this facility in Ashley, Indiana wouldn't be constructed now. Um, it would have been constructed potentially later Maybe never, I don't, I don't think that's the case. But so there's a journey 
of getting better and better from an environmental footprint. And as long as we're better tomorrow and we keep pure with the mission we're on, we think it's a, it's a good approach to take. And can I ask on, on the sort of circular plastics, are, are you going after, would polyethylene be the main target or are you, are you going after xylenes or, or what are the feedstocks that you're targeting to then send back into uh, you know, a polymerization unit to make the, the plastics again. Yeah. So in those situations, it's polyethylene and likely, believe it or not, polypropylene as well, if you take our whole stream. Um, and what we would be doing would be delivering a uh, much more refined hydrocarbon liquid okay. to the producers of the, um, you know, the plastic feedstocks. So they will likely be putting them into their um, into their crackers. And the other thing you, some of you all may be familiar with as well is if we're able to create electrification uh, of our, our reactor vessels, that gas stream could be fed into crackers like ethane crackers, which basically take natural gas to create plastics out of them. So we have a real opportunity to create a super high proportion of truly circular products here. Great, thank you. And, and Sean, for, for you, on, um, you, you, know, you mentioned the sort of life cycle savings around just having a road that, that lasts longer. Um, I guess my, my question is a little bit more around the, the scaling of this and the, basically the demands on, on the urethane production. Do you, do you see an issue at some point where you uh, start to, if this scales as you're envisioning, you start to... Uh, run up against, you know, current production limits on We're spiking, spiking the market, basically, right? Right, right. Yeah, right. So, um, no, we've uh, we have agreements in place to, uh, you know, supply agreements in place. Uh, and we can do a certain amount of, per, you know, roads per year, and they're going to scale with us. Um, they're willing to make the large investment uh, to scale with us. And uh, so we have that part covered. Um, producing the polyols from the recycled plastic at the terminals, uh, you know, we might we might create an excess of polyol that we're not, you know, we have more than we're going to consume in that particular country. Well, that those polyols can be sold into the open market um, as urethane is one of the most ubiquitous materials in the world in terms of you know you sleep on it you. You're sitting on it in your seat, it makes up the inside of your car, insulation in your homes. I mean, it's everywhere. And so those polyols, I mean, the market price for those polyols right now, because of the freeze in Texas, $6 a pound. So we can produce those polyols with recycled plastics for 25 cents a pound. When, when those producers get that type of margin, you know, normal price will probably adjust back to $1.25 a pound. But when they're getting a five times return on selling excess polyol, you know, it's, it's truly a win for the, for the producer. And, and the, the challenges associated with sort of bringing other streams in. So also the recycled pad, I mean, which, it, you know, there's huge volumes of pad. And, and as you pointed out, if you can utilize the, the lower value distressed pad, then, then there's, there's not a, not gonna be a limit on that anytime soon. But um, can you give us a little insight into the, the challenges associated with bringing something like a, like an HDPE or another another feedstock into your right. So we've already started that research uh, with HDPE and looking at how we can bring that in uh, to produce like a chain extender. Uh, and uh, I'm not a chemist, but uh, we're certainly going to go all hands on deck uh, once we uh, join forces with some of these large stakeholders uh, that want to implement. So uh, we certainly will throw a large percentage of our budget at incorporating these uh, other plastic types in, in creative ways, not just as a polyol, but as a chain extender, as a, and, and different, other different uh, uh, methods as well. So, uh, so this is a, a question for both of you that, that, uh, that has uh, come from the, from the audience. So there's, you know, obviously there's huge uh, desire to, do something about plastic in the ocean. Is it at all, do, do you see a, a scenario, maybe I'll start with Bob, where you could you know, harvest some of that trash in the, in the ocean and use that as a, as a feedstock? I don't know how diffuse it is or how energy intensive or impractical it is to try to 
um, collect this, but there are, you know, sort of infamous areas where there's massive amounts of, of floating plastic in the ocean. Do you, do you see any possibility for that, Bob? I do see possibilities uh, for that. I, you know, the ultimate goal here is to keep plastics from ever getting into the ocean because they're so valuable, right? Um, right. Probably not 100% possible, unfortunately. Uh, for a variety of different reasons. But the fact of the matter is we have a lot of plastics in the oceans now. And, you know, I'm fortunate enough uh, recently to spend a lot of time with people who are oceanographers, marine biologists, divers, all those kinds of things, because we're trying to understand uh, the impact in the ocean as well, and then extend that to how can we participate with groups that are doing great things to pull plastics out, some of whom are brands that many of you all, if you track social media are, are really doing some amazing things. Um, the challenge is location and cost. Um, it's very expensive. And I don't think the solutions to the problems we have is just one company like a bright mark, right? I actually think that there is, to use the term again, an ecosystem and part of it, I think is foundations that help support um, these efforts to pull plastics because of the cost associated with them out of the oceans. I do think that governments uh, need to help us with the support as well. And uh, that includes things like the extended producer responsibilities. So do I, I uh, believe that we will be pulling plastics out and that Brightmark will participate? Absolutely. Uh, there are a few things about plastics in the oceans we may not realize. Most of the plastics in the oceans aren't in the big ocean gyres there. Uh, most of the plastics in the ocean are actually very small microplastic particles. And I've spent, you know, as part of some engagement I've had with people who are involved in marine biology, all you have to do is get a beaker uh, that comes out of the ocean and have them uh, take the water and sift the elements out, put it under a microscope, have an opportunity to see it. And you can see strands of plastics, really small strands, and then even smaller particles as well. So um, those are gonna be really challenging to get out of the ocean. So we just need to stop getting them in the ocean. But yes, we'll participate in efforts. And I think you can, with help, get some of the bigger plastics out. Thank you. And we've had discussions with a number of nonprofit groups that are, are working on those challenges now. And um, we don't, I don't really have any insight to, you know, how quickly they're going to scale. But I've been part of conversations that, you know, talking about solar barges that are filters, and they'll put them in the, uh, in the uh, focal points. Um, they'll bail, ships will come, they'll pull those bails, and those, that'll be back subsidized by governments globally, especially we've had. Gives me a, a, a brief opportunity to have it. To, so the, the, the last episode in this season will we'll focus on this issue of microplastic uh, in, the, in the ocean uh, in, in particular. Um, I, wanna, I wanna finish with um, basically asking you, uh, you know, sort of a, a, a wish list. So, and maybe make it a little bit more specific. Is there a particular uh, technology gap that that you see that could conceivably be filled that would really help you scale faster or scale more economically um, to to deploy your uh, your technologies is there is there some is there one piece out there sort of an opportunity for an innovative breakthrough that you see um, or are are you know most of the challenges sort of what we've already uh, you know, discussed around uh, logistics and capital, and, and et cetera. And maybe, maybe Bob, I'll, I'll start with you. Um, yeah, so I think the biggest challenge I see right now is it's something we've talked about a, a few moments ago, and that's on the, and you asked the technology question. I've got a different answer on maybe a couple of different other areas. But on the technology question, is commingled streams of waste, organic material, plastics, a whole host of different things just thrown into, you know, big pits, trucks, buckets, those kinds of things. And how do we efficiently pull those streams apart into very usable 
uh, streams, not just on plastics, but other streams as well. For example, um, the organic matter that comes through um, municipal solid waste um, could be very powerful in terms of creating um, renewable natural gas. But because the commingled streams are there, it makes it very difficult uh, to use a lot of those streams. So if there is uh, a, a set of technologies that are employed that can very efficiently separate into more pure streams, um, I think that's going to go a long way in dealing not just with the plastics issue, but also dealing the broader issue of waste that we have. Um, as human beings, we just throw away and utilize too much. So being able to reuse that stuff we throw away, that's a pretty critical one. Thanks. And, and Sean, is there is there one for you? That we... yeah, I mean, for the system that we have in place now, you know, we feel like we've solved most of the technical challenges, but I mean, that's PET. So what we see in the future is, is commingled streams, you know, streams of, uh, of different grades of, you know, fibers and, you know, solid material. And, uh, you know, urethane is very forgiving in terms of its inputs. And um, I see us spending a great amount of time and resources trying to bring in the other streams. And I don't know how we're going to do it, but, uh, you know, if we can get our initial system running and generating revenue, I'm certain that we're going to find solutions in the future for, for the other streams. And, and you have a, a rapid, rapid sort of testing protocol. If somebody has a new binder derived from a, another stream, can Absolutely. you give an answer quickly? Test it within three days. Okay. Yeah. okay. Yeah. And, and uh, Bob, going back to you on this, on this issue of sorting, which has come up in, in previous uh, episodes and there, there is some, um, there's definitely some work in that space in terms of innovation, some of them leveraging AI, some of them leveraging, um, you know, different detecting technologies. Um, is that, uh, is that a huge bottleneck in your process or do, do you, do you have a sort of partner or, or a municipality that, that helps do that up front or how much of your, um, <clears throat> cost and, and efficiency is sort of, uh, tied to the sorting and removing the plat, you know, even though you could accommodate multiple plastic streams, just removing that from the other non-plastic components uh, in the in the waste streams. For now, in the developing, uh, de more developed countries, it's not as big of an issue. But as we start to move to less developed countries, something I did talk about before, um, then it becomes a big issue. And then as we start. Um, increasing our um, sort of, if you will, penetration rates uh, into waste streams, even in more developed uh, countries, that's where it begins to be an issue. So there's a ton of plastic waste out there right now that we can take. But with, um, you know, in the States, in Europe, and in a lot of places in Asia and other countries. Um, so Will I have enough plastics for the immediate future? You better believe it. But if we want to do it on the ground in places in Asia that are less developed, where, you know, frankly, a lot of the problem is created, for example, with ocean plastics in Asia and Africa, if you look at the studies on that, uh, yeah, we're going to have to figure this out for sure. And, it, and I don't think it's all about just manually doing it. I think that uh, repeatable technologies that are scalable are going to help us a lot. Well, uh, this has been a, a, a truly uh, inspirational session. So, so I want to thank both of you for, for sharing your visions and uh, your incredible ambition and, and actually really exciting uh, technologies. Um, I want to encourage anyone uh, who, who wants to reach out to either Bob or Sean, please, uh, please do so. You can do so through the Tomcat. You can, you can uh, do so directly. You can connect through um, the Tomcat LinkedIn group, please do uh, uh, get in touch. And uh, thank you. We really, we really uh, appreciate the, the time and, and all that you've shared this afternoon. Thank you oh, so thanks, much. Matthew. It's been a great yeah, no, it's great. Yeah, we're super optimistic here. We think the future is bright. And one of the reasons why I feel that way is when we have the opportunity to engage. I, I know we're down to 61 participants now, but at one point in time, we had 130. It's amazing. So there's a lot of people who are going to help make this happen. So we're really optimistic about the future. Thank you, Bob. Thank Thanks, you, Thanks, Gary.
Thank you.